Hello, I'm Brandon and I'm an instructor and trainer at UFHR Training and Organizational Development. I love design and I have been lucky enough to be on the TEDxUF stage, not as a presenter, but as an MC. So this is my jam. Today we're going to talk about how to make your PowerPoint presentations look like they belong on the TED stage. Shout out to the Creative Works team for recording this presentation uh, today in their studio. So today's agenda. First, we're going to uh, talk about three main things. To improve our presentation visuals, those three areas that we're going to discuss are, first, the human brain. Your audience is made up of human beings with, well, human brains. These brains have natural weaknesses and strengths. How can we create visuals that avoid the weaknesses and capitalize on the strengths? Second, we're going to talk about planning our visuals. Creating an amazing visual presentation takes both imagination and planning. I'm going to show you a technique that will allow you to be more creative and strategic with your visuals. And finally, we're going to talk about how to create eye-grabbing visuals. The best presentation visuals have certain characteristics. We're going to talk about what those characteristics are. We're also going to discuss how to create or locate great visual resources to use in your next big speech. In 1987, there was a TV public service announcement that said, this is your brain, this is your brain on drugs. Any questions? I remember first seeing this ad when I was a child. It totally freaked me out. I remember thinking, I am totally staying away from drugs. After I saw the ad a few times though, I remember asking my mom about it. What do they mean by drugs exactly? Aren't medicines considered drugs? Should I be worried about the Tylenol I took last week? She explained that there are bad drugs and there are good drugs. Some things we put in our bodies can be very dangerous, and some things can be very helpful. When it comes to our visuals in our presentations, a similar truth emerges. Depending on the types of visuals we're using and how we're using them, we can harm our communication goals or we can help them significantly. Let's start with how visuals can harm our goals. I have seen thousands of presentations over the years, and one mistake I almost always see, including here at UF, is that people try to cram too much information on a single slide, and almost all of it is text. Here are some examples I've seen in my work over the years. Don't worry, I've removed the names, faces, images, and replaced the content with fake text to protect people's identities. And just so you think I'm not picking on anyone, I admit one of these is mine from many, many years ago. Here is our first uh, <laughs> offending slide. Here is another. I mean, look at how much content is on each of these slides. Nancy Duarte, one of the thought leaders and practitioners in the field of presentation design and development, calls visuals like these teleprompters, or slidegements. A teleprompter is a slide that a presenter simply reads. This serves as a crutch for a presenter who hasn't done enough preparation. A slidegement is a full document's worth of information masquerading as a presentation visual. When presenters use slides as teleprompters, they often turn their backs to the audience and just read off the slide. The problem with this is that the audience gets impatient, reads ahead, and often has to wait for the presenter to catch up. When presenters use slidegements, they often ignore the text-heavy message on the slide. The presenter will loosely summarize the message on the slide by using different language or in a worst case scenario, talk about something entirely different. The problem with this approach is that the audience can't simultaneously process the competing verbal and textual images and messages. We create what is called cognitive overload. Our audience just can't pay attention to everything we're presenting because it's TMI, too much information. What we do is we create uh, a situation where somebody's thinking, do I look at the presenter and listen to them, or do I look at the slide? Do I look at the presenter, do I look at the slide? When it comes to visuals in our presentations, a similar truth emerges. Depending on the types of visuals we're using and how we're using them, we can harm our communication goals or we can help them significantly. 
we have to train ourselves to just say no to these three things. Oppressive text, disharmony, and seductive details. The mere sight of a slide like this one is demotivating to your audience. It makes people tired and less willing to stay engaged with you. Often, presenters will show a slide like this and just give you the big idea rather than refer to all the content. So rather than create an overwhelming slide and then gloss over it with the gist, just put the main point or the gist on the slide and then talk over that. Don't think bullet points. Think the main point. So here's an example of a slide that might be demoralizing or demotivating to someone watching your presentation. So rather than uh, provide so much data in a visual that you're not going to refer to every point of, perhaps think about a way to uh, summarize the data in a more compact way like this. Or perhaps maybe just point out the main point of the slide with a strong visual and your audience is going to walk away with that bit of information a whole lot better than if you show them this, which may have the same information. And if you are someone who is presenting and you need to give this kind of a graph to your learners, feel free to print it out and provide it to people, uh, a tangible version or as a PDF if you're on Zoom, and they can refer back to it at a future time. So disharmony. This is when your verbal delivery does not match well with what is on your slides. When our words don't harmonize well with our visuals, we force people to choose a channel or flip back and forth between two stations. This results in people not getting the full message. This is an example. If I'm talking about one thing and showing another, people aren't going to know what to pay attention to. Instead, you might want to uh, simply talk about what's on the slide, right? So seductive details. This is disharmony to the extreme. Seductive details are attractive and unnecessary details in a presentation that pull an audience off of what should be the straight and narrow path of your message. Uh, so for example, this comic. Uh, because a comic is bright and shiny, people are likely to tune you out and read the comic as you are likely doing to me right now. The best practice is to eliminate extraneous or decorative images, animations, etc. If you plan to put a comic or another bright shiny object in your talk, you should refer to it directly and then explain how it fits in your message. So a key takeaway here. Abraham Lincoln once stated, a house divided against itself cannot stand. The same is true of our presentations. If we want to have an audience's undivided attention, we have to deliver presentations that are undivided. We must create unity between our verbal message and our visuals. Another key takeaway, the KISS principle. Keep it simple, silly. We shouldn't crush people with detail in our presentations. Less is more. All right, so at this point, we've talked about some common mistakes people make with their slide visuals. The good news is that when visual aids are used well, they're like a wonder drug for your audience that significantly increases their learning performance. So we've all heard the expression, a picture is worth a thousand words. When it comes to our presentation visuals, is it true that pictures are more valuable communication tools than text? The answer is a resounding yes. John Medina, the author of Brain Rules, reports that vision trumps all of our other senses. We learn and remember best through pictures, not through language. Our brains soak up pictures much more readily. The more visual our messages become, the more likely it is for the information to be recognized and recalled later. According to Medina, this is called the pictorial superiority effect. For example, if you only hear information, you are likely to remember about 10% of that info three days later. If you add a picture, however, your recall soars to 65%. 
In other words, a picture will help you remember six times more information than listening to the words alone. Wow. We are so much more effective and powerful as communicators when we get visual. It's like the difference between bench pressing 50 pounds versus bench pressing 325 pounds. We're so much stronger as communicators when we make our messages visual. The literature is filled with impressive stats related to visuals and learning. For example, visuals are processed 60,000 times faster in the brain than text. Our eyes can process 36,000 images per hour. Visual aids improve understanding by up to 400%. Our brains thrive on visuals. Why is this the case? Well, Medina reports that vision takes up half of our brain's resources. Another explanation is Alan Pavio's dual coding theory. What is this theory? Well, let's suppose I want to teach you three concepts. For the purpose of this example, I'll keep these concepts really simple. The concepts are dog, cat, and fish. If I teach these concepts through text alone, your brain will encode that information verbally. However, if I add a supporting image or a series of images to each concept, your brain will store that visual information in a separate part of your memory. So what are the implications of this? Well, if we communicate with language and supporting visuals, the information gets more deeply encoded in the minds of our audience. Rather than just having the information stored in one place, they have it stored in two. This makes it much easier for them to recall the information later and act on it. Visuals heighten emotion and deepen learning. Another reason visuals are so powerful in communications is that they evoke emotion. Pictures that evoke an emotional response release cortisol or dopamine in our brains. Cortisol is a hormone that is released when we experience stress. So something you just communicated to me is distressing and now my attention is very focused. Dopamine is a neurochemical that is released when we experience pleasure. So something you are communicating is very pleasing and I am willing to take this journey with you. Think of these organic chemicals as being like crazy glue that makes our brains sticky. As new information hits our brain during this type of adhesive state, learning is more likely to stick with us. This is why we can remember where we were on 9-11, or why we can easily recall vivid details of a special day like a wedding or the birth of a child. These are emotionally charged events, and when we are emotional, our brains are biologically primed for learning. Therefore, if we leverage powerful visuals in our presentations that elicit an emotional response from the audience, we are greatly increasing the likelihood that they will deeply ingrain our messages and be more likely to act on that information. Maya Angelou once said, people will forget what you said. People will forget what you did, but people will never forget how you made them feel. With our visuals, we can stir people's hearts and souls more deeply and more deeply feel the message we are delivering. It's not enough for us to just impart information. For us to be at our persuasive best, we have to get our audience to feel something. All right, at this point, let's talk about planning. Some of you might be thinking, well, this all sounds great, but I'm not really a visual person. I don't know where to begin, and I certainly can't create the types of things I see in TED Talks. Well, that simply isn't true. When it comes to making visuals for our presentations, we have to let ourselves dream. If you've looked at a great presentation and said, well, I can't do something like that, I don't have the talent or the resources, to that I say two things. One, you have an imagination. You might not have the production skills or the talents, but every person watching this has an imagination. And we don't do ourselves any favors when we suppress our own brainstorming. We have to give ourselves permission to imagine the possibilities and dream big when it comes to our presentation visuals. And two, 
you do have resources. You work at the University of Florida, a top five public university. It's not like you're working at a startup company where it's you and a couple of other people. If you have a communications person in your department, partner with that person. Your college or your department may have one or more instructional designers. Trust me as an instructional designer when I say they would love to help you make something like this. If you have a budget, you might consider working with a department like The Sit or Creative Works. UF has loads of resources to assist you with making incredible presentation visuals. So in terms of planning, using a simple storyboard is a great approach. Basically, you journal what you want to say in your presentation. You put that content in the left-hand column here, and then you plan out your visual ideas in the right-hand column. Your visual ideas can be in the form of notes, or maybe sketch out some basic ideas on sticky, on sticky pads. Uh, these examples actually come from Gar Reynolds, the author of Presentation Zen. Sketching is a part of his creative process. He uses sketches as a jumping off point for making his actual slides, and this is what those sketches ultimately became. For our final segment, let's talk about four key design principles that you can use when designing your slideshow presentations. There are four main principles I use, and I encourage others to use them as well. They are contrast, alignment, repetition, and proximity. A simple way to remember these principles is the acronym CARP. The first is contrast. To add contrast to your PowerPoint designs, you need to create noticeable differences between two or more elements. For example, white font contrasts sharply with a black background. White text over a dark blue background is also a good choice. On the flip side, notice how this example has poor contrast, making it pretty difficult to read. It would be better if it looked like this. Some colors to avoid, especially for text, are bright red and green. People who are colorblind will have a tough time seeing those colors. Uh, for example, a colorblind person would probably have difficulty seeing the number six in this visual. Did you know Mark Zuckerberg is colorblind? That is why Facebook's colors are blue and white. So here's another cool thing about high contrast. Research shows that it's actually perceived as more truthful. So the very fact that I am presenting you this very research with a high contrast slide makes it appear more truthful. If I were to present it like this, it wouldn't carry the same weight. Alignment. It's important for your audience to see that the elements in your PowerPoint designs were not randomly put together. They need to see that each item was carefully placed together to create a connection and a narrative. The principle of alignment will help you with that. Using the grid lines as a guide here, look at how this company logo was aligned perfectly with the background image. Following the roadmap theme, the designers used an open road as a background image. The company logo was then aligned to fit snugly around the road. I think this is great alignment. Alignment can also be used to show the relationship among items on a slide. Notice in this example how the alignment of these various shapes work. They work together to show a clean process of one, two, three. And also alignment as it pertains to text, you're going to want to pick one and stick with it. Try to avoid mixing left, center, and right justifications, especially within the same slide. This particular slide has left alignment, center alignment, and right alignment. It would be better if they were all aligned one way like this. Repetition. It's also important to look at your PowerPoint design as a whole document and not just individual slides. The principle of repetition allows you to create a unified overall design using the same elements throughout your PowerPoint deck. Stick with using the same fonts and colors throughout so that your, your audience can easily see a definite structure and a clear progression. So an example um, is that in these slides from this template, the 
exact images and angles and colors are slightly different and the font sizes are slightly different, but you can tell because they all are, um, because they all repeat the same visual motifs that they go together. Additionally, as it pertains to fonts, sans serif fonts, you're going to want to use those for presentations and not fonts with serifs. Serifs are great for print, not for PowerPoints. Proximity. In design, the principle of proximity is all about grouping together similar elements to create one cohesive visual unit. The audience is able to perceive meaning from the location of these elements. Notice how the proximity principle is applied in the following examples and what the location of the items communicates. Order. Chaos. Conformity. Or perhaps lack of conformity. Um, I want you to think, what does the proximity principle communicate in this visual? Who is the person on the left? Who are the people on the right? And if you think uh, the person on the left is the boss and the people on the right are the team, you're probably right. But all of that is communicated through just the size of the images and where they are located uh, in correlation to each other. Long story short, CARP is helpful in making your slides look highly polished and professional. If you don't use CARP, your slides will probably look like crap. So now that we've talked about many of the principles that go into making a great presentation, let's talk about some tools that you have uh, right at your fingertips on your computer. First of all, PowerPoint templates are incredibly helpful because people have gone in and created slide decks that you can insert your content into and the slide decks already follow the principles of CARP. Uh, for example, you can go to the Microsoft Office website and find hundreds and hundreds and thousands of uh, PowerPoint decks that are pre-made there. And this is an example of one. Uh, this is just something you can download for free uh, from the Office website. This looks great to me. If I saw this at a presentation, I would think that that person was a great PowerPoint designer. And again, it's as simple as downloading this off of the Office website. There are other websites that also have numerous PowerPoint presentations that you can download for free. And this is another example of one of those websites. Additionally, I like to recommend the website Canva. You can find it at canva.com. It's a free design tool website. And what you see here is an example of uh, what it looks like when you are accessing the site. They have countless free templates that you can use that were created by world-class designers. And you simply add your pictures and your text into a pre-made template and you can download it from Canva. Um, it is my personal go-to website when I'm looking for design ideas myself. And it is, again, pretty much all free and accessible for you to use. Highly recommend looking into it if you're not familiar with it already. So we talked about using high quality, emotionally evocative images in our presentations. You might be asking, where do I find those? Well, what, what you don't want to do is go to Google Image Search and just take whatever you see when you search for your keyword or phrase. Because 99 times out of 100, the images that pop up are copyrighted by someone else. And you don't want to use copyrighted images in your presentations. So you're going to want to use stock photos. And th there are numerous royalty-free image sites out there. Stock photos, royalty-free images basically mean the same thing. Um, if you'd like a copy of the handout that's referenced on this slide, feel free to reach out to training and organizational development at training at ufl.edu, and it has in it a list of 24 royalty-free image websites, but there are many, many more than that, 
if you search on the internet for that phrase, royalty-free images. Um, this is an example of just random stock photo websites that I went to when creating this PowerPoint presentation, and it shows you the kind of images I'm talking about when I say that these websites have those emotionally evocative, uh, high quality images. This is from Pixabay, one of the leading stock photo websites. All of these images are free and free to use and copyright free. This is from a different website uh, and yet another. You can see they all kind of have a similar uh, look and feel, but they each some there, there's some overlap in the images that you're gonna find on these websites, but often they curate their own libraries. So if you don't find what you're looking for on one, try another one. I also recommend using icons. There are gonna be many times that you're presenting and your slide may not be conducive to a full picture of the thing that you're referring to, and an icon can tell the story. I recommend using the website Noun Project. That's where I go for my icons if I'm ever looking for something that may not be built into PowerPoint. They have, again, thousands and thousands of icons for pretty much any word you might search. Synergy, that's a, that's a word that you, might, uh, that you might use in your presentations. Just, just typing in the word synergy comes up with all of these different visual representations of that word. So you'll be able to find what you're looking for, for sure. Another way to get more mileage out of the pictures that you find on the internet uh, on one of these stock photo websites is by incorporating layers, incorporating transparent PNG files. So a transparent PNG, as you can see here, is an image where either you, using Photoshop or something, or someone online has uploaded a picture where the outline of the main subject in the image has been cut out. You can see with this boy and this dog, uh, we don't know where this picture was taken because they were photoshopped out of the larger image. And if you have a transparent PNG, you can layer an image and tell a different story using the same elements. So we have here a transparent PNG of a girl who looks a little bit bored or perturbed, right? Well, that tells its own story, but what if we layered this image over a classroom? What does that tell you? Or what if we layered this over an image of a college classroom? What that tells me is that this girl is very bored because she's so smart that even a college class is not keeping her attention. But what if instead we layer this image over a party? That tells a completely different story. So you can, like I said, you can get more mileage out of individual images by uh, using transparent PNG files or creating them yourself. And there are many uh, websites that you can find these as well, and here are a few of them. Last, I wanna present you with PowerPoint design ideas. This is a relatively new function of PowerPoint, so if you don't have the most recent up-to-date iteration of Microsoft Office, it might not be installed in your version of PowerPoint. I highly recommend going to the UFIT website and downloading the newest version of Microsoft Office, which is free for all UF employees, um, and you will get PowerPoint design ideas. So what is it? Well, it's this button inside of PowerPoint where if you type something into your slide, like for example, we have a quote from Martin Luther King Jr. here. If you type something into your slide and then click the design ideas button, it will provide you with a number of uh, what PowerPoint thinks is uh, good designs based on the content that it's reading in your slide. So what you see under this icon and this arrow is the design ideas uh, window open. You can see that there's all these different um, design ideas, <laughs> I mean that's why it's called design ideas, that populate when you click that button based on simply the text that you have in the slide. 
So an example of what this looks like in practice, you can see here we have a black slide with white text on it. We used design ideas and it turned into this. As you can see, it's a powerful tool, but make sure that if you do use design ideas, you remember the principles of design that we already talked about today. We don't want every single slide in our PowerPoint deck to have a different theme, which is a risk you run if you use exclusively PowerPoint design ideas, because it will read what's on each individual slide and give you what it thinks that slide should look like. It won't necessarily process it in the context of the entire presentation and telling a uniform, uh, uniform story with your PowerPoint designs. Let's recap. To improve our presentation visuals, we covered three main topics today. First, the human brain. Your audience is made up of human beings with human brains. These brains have natural weaknesses and strengths. We must create visuals that avoid the weaknesses and capitalize on the strengths. We talked about planning our visuals. Creating an amazing visual presentation takes both imagination and planning. Continue to use the storyboard method to plan your script first and then your visuals second. We talked about creating eye-grabbing visuals. The best presentation visuals have certain characteristics. We talked about CARP. We talked about show, don't tell. We talked about the KISS principle. I hope you enjoyed this lesson. I'm always available at training at ufl.edu if you have any additional questions related to presentation visuals. Thank you.